after school, I spent 40 misbegotten years in American politics uh, and involved in presidential campaigns. And then I finally, thanks to a number of people, became an honest person, or at least a semi honest <laughs> person, and uh, found uh, yet another career as a teacher and uh, writer and commentator. I used to run campaigns, now I run my mouth on television. Uh, we're here tonight for a discussion between two very interesting people, one of whom is I'll say in a minute is someone I know very well, and someone all of us, whose writings all of us should know well, because they are they're very powerful and revealing. Uh, the occasion for this is, of course, the publication of Eric's book, Going Solo. But let me first introduce Sudhir Pankatesh, who is the William R. Ramsford Professor of Sociology and the leader of the Committee on Global Thought in Columbia. Uh, his most recent book is Gang Leader for a Day, uh, which he spent a decade on, which is being translated into languages ranging from Italian and French to Chinese and Korean. And you can buy it and get it signed in the back of the room after this discussion is over. And as I told Eric that I'm going to steal the line back, his book is $18, Eric's is $31. Um, <laughs> so here has written several other prize-winning uh, books and offered breakthrough insights into the role of black market economies from sex workers to drug trafficking to daycare to the revitalization of New York City since 1999. Eric told me, and I want to use Eric's exact words, Sudhir is a kindred spirit, gang leader was a bestseller, and he's committed to public engagement too. We're as happy to have him with us tonight as the Obama administration was to have him with the Senior Research Advisor at the Department of Justice in 2010 and 2011. Now for me, it's an honor uh, to introduce Eric Kleinenberg. Uh, he's a professor of sociology. He's the author of landmark books on the heat wave that devastated Chicago in the 1990s and the concentration of media ownership in America. But uh, Eric and I are close in more ways than one. He's a very close friend. And he's my next door neighbor. Um, so are uh, Professor Caitlin Zaloon, his wife, who is an extraordinary person, very much in her own right. Uh, his son Cyrus, uh, who uh, is actually more articulate than Eric, and that's saying quite a bit. Uh, and his daughter Lila, who lights up our lives. Uh, Eric has written a brilliant, and I don't use that word often, uh, an insightful book about a revolution in the way we live. Or maybe I should say, how many of the eyes among us now live, alone and yet often, if not always, engaged as parts of a vibrant community. Uh, the book's gotten widespread attention. You can't pick up the New York Times without reading about going solo. I'm beginning to think it's a promotional paper for this book. Uh, <laughs> It's the, you know, they have this old thing in, in newspapers about the articles are what you wrap around the revenue copy. Well, Eric's allowed them to get a lot more revenue copy in because there's been a lot written about it. Today it was the centerpiece of David Brooks' column, with which unusually I agreed up to the last paragraph, where Brooks seemed to say that while well, Eric is right, we also have to return society to the old structures. Uh, soon enough, going solo will be the centerpiece of Bill Maher's show. So, they're expanding the spectrum. Uh, one political note, and I guess that's inevitable for me, uh, this book has important implications for the 2012 campaign. Uh, I think Rick Santorum, and to the extent he has to channel him, Mitt Romney and their kind of exclusive emphasis on a narrow and, in my view, extreme notion of family values are reading a decisive portion of the electorate out of the dialogue. And that's the portion of the electorate and of society that Eric's written about. But the book has implications for society that go far beyond this. And that's what's going to be discussed here tonight. So I'm done talking. They're going to talk. We're going to learn a lot. And afterwards, as an author myself, I ask you, please buy the books. <laughs> social life that um, 
sends his intellect into what he produces. And actually, I thought I would um, begin with that kind of a question because um, knowing Eric, I couldn't help but well, want to know something about um, the personal motivation to uh, think about this subject matter. For those who, for those of us who've read uh, the other works, the major books that Eric has, has published, um, we know that there is there's uh, a an attraction to a kind of vulnerability or fragility in, in life. And I'm very curious to know, uh, I'm, I'm observing that and wondering, um, so the first question is just what draws you to these kinds of subjects and these kinds of groups that um, uh, have a fragility built into them, sometimes because of a precarious situation, sometimes because of a structural situation that they occupy in society, or simply uh, sometimes because they're not recognized, or am I completely off base in no, I, I think that's right. And um, well, before I answer, I just want to say, uh, you know, first, uh, thank you to uh, Bob for um, the hometown introduction. Uh, uh, you, you'd never expect to start a conversation about your book with a, by hearing about your, your son and your daughter, but uh, it soften, softens you up a little bit, appropriately. So, and I also want to thank uh, you, Sidir, for, for being here and participating in, in this event. Uh, Sidir is like the guy who is you know, the senior in high school when you were the freshman. Uh, you thought like, wow, it would be so cool to be able to do what Sadir does someday, and so it's really kind of a, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, that's, uh, so it's, 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 it's fun to be here uh, you know, sharing the stage with you. Um, so, you know, in, in a funny way, this book and I think um, my work in sociology um, uh, are, are rooted in my experience growing up in Chicago, uh, and growing up in Chicago in the 1970s and 80s, uh, and um, growing up in a city where I felt that um, there were so many interesting things happening, uh, and so little conversation about things that seemed kind of necessary to, to process in some way. And I think even as a very young person, I was struck by this kind of dissonance between the kind of the, the, the language about the, the city and, and what it represented and, and, and how it was organized and the reality of what that city looked like. So I grew up in a neighborhood called Old Town, um, which is like a, kind of at the border of the Gold Coast and Lincoln Park and Cabrini Green. And uh, growing up there, it was very clear that there were certain places that you could go. And then there were these no-go areas uh, you know, where I was instructed not to cross the street, not to time, um, and it, th that world seemed very exotic and, and strange to me. Um, and kind of as I got older and older and learned more and more about the city, I realized that um, the, the, the kind of the norm of acting as if this wasn't there, of taking for granted um, the, the kind of divisive structure, divided structure of Chicago, uh, was rotten somehow. Um, and so I think from, her, from like the moment I started doing sociology, part of the idea was to, kind of, to go out and explore not just this kind of, what people sometimes think of as the other America or some invisible part of the city. I, I never thought it was exactly other or invisible, it was very visible, but to explore kind of why it is that we weren't talking about it. And by we, it was kind of my little world of people in, in Old Town and Lincoln Park in Chicago. Um, what, what, what did that express? What, you know, what, were, what were we saying by not saying much about it? And, and that was the beginning of the heat wave book, um, where you know, 700 people had died in a couple of days in Chicago. Uh, and what was striking to me was not just that hundreds of people had died and, and that hundreds had died alone, but also that it, it had somehow failed to register as an event. It was this kind of non-event. Um, people talked about it very rarely, and when they did, they sometimes questioned whether it was really real. And that became, in a strange way, the, the, the kind of way into this project, uh, which began as a kind of follow-up inquiry into this world of living alone uh, and being isolated and vulnerable in cities. Uh, you know, I, I walked away from the Heatwave Project convinced that I had stumbled upon a social problem that needed far more attention than it was getting, um, and that was much bigger than Chicago. And I started doing the research and by kind of abstracting out and scaling up a little bit and thinking about the, the change driving this, you know, why so many people lived alone and died alone in Chicago. And 
at some very early moment in the project, I discovered that um, isolation um, and the social problem was just one part of what was in fact a much bigger social change. Um, and that in a way, what I had to grapple with uh, in, the, in the project was the fact that literally for the first time in all of human history, we now live in a world in which there are enormous numbers of people who are on their own. And they're, and they're living alone at different stages of their lives, um, but they're living alone for long periods of time. Uh, and not just in the United States, but all over the world. And this for me was a real challenge because I'm accustomed, as you say, to, to, to thinking about vulnerability and precariousness. And I'm kind of intellectually motivated by um, addressing these kinds of unspoken things. Uh, but it turned out that what I had to explore was something else unspoken, the rise of living alone, uh, but with a, a kind of very different tone. It, it wasn't just a social problem. I came to believe that it was a, it's actually a social experiment uh, and something for which we need a different um, language uh, to make sense of. And, and yet you come out with um, a very, very soulful appreciation for people who go through this journey like alone. It, it doesn't Therapy, sympathy for this group, as if they're missing out on something, etc. Right? So, oh, sorry. Um, I was just, I was just observing that even, even though there is a vulnerability to the group, you, you humanize them in a way that, um, and you uh, show, I, I think, the dignity of, of the lives and, and the, the variability of the lives at the very same time. I, I was struck by. I'm going to just point to a couple passages and ask you. I was struck by one passage in which um, you compare the U.S. with Sweden. And before I read the passage, here's, here's the, the reason that the, it, it caught my attention. I have a great deal of difficulty as someone who studies crime, uh, policing, justice, convincing people of some basic, what I would like to think of as facts, but everything's open for interpretation. Um, and that is that, uh, two things. One is that I, I don't think I've ever met a, a cop who says that their role in an inner city neighborhood is to prevent crime from, from occurring. They almost always say to me that their role is to make sure that it doesn't get out of control. I've rarely met residents of uh, low-income uh, segregated neighborhoods who similarly will say that what they expect in terms of good policing is that police will, will make sure that crime doesn't happen. Instead, it's often just make sure that we can cope with it so that it doesn't destroy the social fabric. I mean, that may not be the language, but essentially it's the same. There's a, there's a symmetry there. Yet, it's very difficult to either adopt that into a policy framework, one, or, uh, or to take it very seriously because that's not necessarily what I would want in my neighborhood. And I want police to stop crime or prevent crime. So there are a lot of assumptions that we bring into looking at something like living alone, and then we have to challenge ourselves, and no matter how much evidence we have in front of us, we are going to walk away saying, well, you know, I couldn't believe what I believe. So the question is, what are you finding in the reception of this book that, um, that what, is one, what are one of some of the hardest things for people to take out, that they still cling on to? I can think of ideas about living alone, but even I was, I was reading this, I said, no, I still think it's fine. <laughs> And there's, there's one here, I'm just going to read okay. a couple sentences as you think about an answer to the, the resistance that we have to this argument. So it says on page 213, one full paragraph, consider Sweden where about 47% of all households have just one resident, or more specifically Stockholm where a staggering 60% of all dwellings are occupied by someone who lives alone. Like the US, Sweden has a deep-seated cultural legacy of individualism and self-reliance, but it's the nation's ongoing commitment to collectivism, not its problems with atomization or social isolation, that most impressed me when I traveled there to learn about how and why so many Swedes live alone today. So there seems to be a buffer there. There seems to be something that they have that we don't. Context matters in some respect. It's not just some isolated statistic. It's a history of the Yeah, so, so there are a few things I, I feel like I need to say, and, and the 
you know, first address is kind of people's resistance and kind of reception of the book, and then I want to talk about this idea of why living alone is, in fact, far more common in the kind of socialist-leaning welfare states of Scandinavia than it is uh, in the rest of the world, which was a surprising thing to me. So, you know, the first thing to say, um, and maybe this goes without saying for sociologists, but not so much for people um, in the policy world, is that um, this is not a book of um, advocacy. Uh, it's not a book in which I'm kind of making the case against marriage or the case for living alone. Uh, I'm not urging you to leave your wife when you go home. Uh, and it would be hypocritical of me uh, to do that with my wife in the front row. Um, um, uh, and, and, um, and yet there, there is a kind of way in which you, know, you can read the book as um, kind of a, having a rosier portrait of living alone than you expect to find. Um, and certainly uh, part of that is due to the tone uh, because I do believe that um, we have a way of um, describing social changes as if they are inevitably about the fall of something and the loss of something better. There was almost always a golden age uh, where people were better connected, communities were more cohesive, and each of us was less lonely than we are today. Often it's like 30 or 40 years before the moment that we're in. Uh, uh, and I think we do ourselves a disservice when we um, define our, our world that way. Um, I think that we're more interesting than we conventionally think we are or say we are. And we kind of fail to um, appreciate all the interesting ways in which we live uh, when we fall into this lament about things lost. So um, the social experiment framework allows me, I think, to kind of get out of that by saying, let's, let's consider how incredible it is that we've adapted as much as we have in 50 or 60 years to this um, transformation. Um, so it's neither the case for nor against. But, but I do take it very seriously I do take the challenge of debunking some of the myths very seriously. And so, for instance, one thing that people have a hard time accepting um, uh, is the finding that uh, people who live alone are, in fact, you know, on average, more likely than people who are married to spend time with their friends and neighbors. Um, they can be more social in that respect. Um, it's probably not a surprise to most people that they're more likely to go out at night and spend time and money and bars and cafes and restaurants, the kind of third spaces where people um, engage in a public setting. But it's also very surprising to, to learn that uh, people who live alone, and especially women, are more likely to volunteer in civic organizations than people who are married. Uh, there's a, a sociologist named Na Naomi Gerstel who's been talking recently about the, the problem of the greedy marriage, uh, which is that marriages can be incredibly demanding on people's time and especially on the um, time of, of women. Um, obviously not in my family, um, but <laughs> apparently I've read that in many families, um, <laughs> women tend to do more of the domestic labor uh, uh, to not be recognized for this. Um, and when there are children involved and there's you know, two people working, there's not a lot of time or energy left at the end of the day uh, you know, to go volunteer. That's a hard thing to do. Um, so, you know, th those are things that I think people really struggle with. And, and frankly, uh, people really struggle with just the facts of this book. You know, the, the, the report about the prevalence of living alone is, is really surprising that, you know, um, in Manhattan, almost one of every two households is a one-person household. That in Washington, D.C., it's about the same level. That in Atlanta, in Denver, uh, Seattle, San Francisco, Cleveland, uh, you know, more than 40% of households are one-person households. This is something that's hard to believe until you discover that the rates of living alone in Europe uh, or in, in, in Japan are even higher. Um, but um, it, it's, it's not the story we tell ourselves. So let me end with the, um, the Scandinavia, you know, Sweden thing. Um, I'm very influenced by the work of uh, Emile Durkheim, the French sociologist, one of the kind of founding figures in my, in my field, um, who wrote about um, the ways in which our individualism, our capacity to kind of um, express ourselves, to kind of 
have autonomy is in fact um, underwritten by enormous amounts of collective labor and investment in the, in the common good. And, and in a way, I, you know, I've come to believe even more strongly since starting this book um, that it's interdependence that makes independence possible. And, and what you see in places like Sweden is an investment in the common good uh, done through you know, subsidized public housing, for instance, that created housing stock for people to live alone, or you know, guaranteed access to healthcare, which gives people the personal security uh, to live alone, uh, social insurance, or what we call social security, that gives people the economic means to live alone when the market fails. Um, it's, by, it's only by investing in the collective uh, that you allow people to express some part of themselves that they want to express, that you allow that kind of autonomy. Now that's an uncomfortable idea for many people um, whose vision of kind of freedom and uh, politics is very different, but it is what I believe. <laughs> I, I think one of the one of the themes that runs through this uh, book very powerfully is the idea of freedom or autonomy and liberation. And it's, it's there in places, um, it pops up and rears its head in, in, in places unexpectedly sometimes. Um, one of the strongest characters, if you will, in, in this book uh, uh, are women. It's a very strong kind of gender analysis of, of where our society is going. And again, I just want to. Um, Point to an interesting passage, because some of us who came through the last 20 years of uh, uh, social science research on urban poverty, um, one thing we experienced is the overwhelming, um, the disparaging way in which African American single women were treated in social science for doing one thing, which is living alone. There was, a, there was a deep set of debates that, um, uh, about the factors that produced uh, single-headed female households. And uh, on one side, uh, there's an argument that um, this group uh, can't, find, uh, can't find enough men to marry. So it's an, it's a, it's an outcome of a, a lack of uh, employed men who could support their households. On the other side, there were those who were championing from a feminist perspective often that this is a, this is, this is a sign of liberation, et cetera. This is a sign of empowerment. Why are we, why are we always reading this group off against their uh, relationships with men in the household? I want to point to a passage here because that kind of argument starts to um, arise for those of us who followed that debate for a very long time. On page 89, that you write, why have so many of us given up uh, given up the supposed benefits of wedlock for the tumult of being single and the possibility that we will spend the rest of our days living alone. One reason is that modern women, untethered from tr traditional economic and sexual constraints, have discovered that going solo can liberate them from the many unrecognized, unappreciated, and unrewarded responsibilities that they still take on as homemakers and caretakers and allows them to attend to their own needs. The burden of the, quote, women's role, unquote, in marriage helps explain why two out of three women surveyed in the AARP study claimed that they had demanded a divorce from their spouse. Mm -hmm. Two out of three, I think that might be an underestimate. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, a, this is a nice tension that runs through this book, which is that there's, it's, it's liberatory and it's a constraint. Um, either in the context of, of of women specifically, or in a broader sense, um, what should we be mindful of as more of us start to live alone? Or is there something that if we don't attend to it now, either in the sense of appreciating it, acknowledging it, reducing the stigma, et cetera, or setting up our cities and our lives in a particular way, um, we're gonna fail to really support this trend. So, um, so let me kind of circle back to the issue about um, African-American women living alone, which I think is in some ways a, a kind of distinctive case um, and, and, and um, begin with a, uh, you know, the, kind of my first reaction to that uh, passage and to, and to your comment, which is um, that, that life is um, tricky and full of challenges for everyone, um, you know, kind of regardless of whether you live with someone or you live alone. 
And one of the problems with the, um, the kind of whatever discourse there is about living alone is that it tends not to have the comparison case. Um, so people can zoom in on the, on, the, on the vulnerabilities of people who are going solo without recognizing that there, there are vulnerabilities that are kind of, that apply to people in other situations as, as well. So we really need to think about what is, what is distinctive about this condition. Um, and, and we don't do that enough. So, so l let me kind of be more specific about this. The, the study that you're referring to in the two out of three women say that they're the ones who chose uh, divorce. It was a study by the AARP of older Americans, uh, terrifyingly enough, I think it was over the age of 40, uh, uh, you know, who, who have been divorced. And it was a study of remarriage rates, which were shockingly low to me, much lower than I expected. Um, uh, people tend not to get remarried if they divorce over the age of 40. Um, uh, and that's especially true for women. So one, one argument that's out there is that you know, women don't remarry because there's just not a lot of available men. Men have access to younger women in the marriage market. Um, you know, cougars not, notwithstanding, uh, it's, not, you know, it's not an equal, not an equal market. To use the economist language here, um, but a really interesting and different kind of picture emerges when you talk to people who uh, have been married and are now living alone, and a different picture emerges from this AARP study as well. And that is, um, we often think about loneliness as the thing that worries us about living alone. Um, it, it seems like it must be deeply unsatisfying at some level because of how lonely it can be, but. The people that we interviewed for this book repeatedly said that there was nothing lonelier and more isolating than living in the wrong marriage, and than being in the wrong relationship. And that the loneliness, I came to believe, had a different valence and significance, because if you're living alone and you feel lonely, you know, what psychologists tell us now um, is that that loneliness is the cue for you to go out and get in the world and engage with people. Um, and the loneliness can be productive if it's not excessive. If you're lonely and isolated and you're in a marriage, and if the marriage itself is the source of that feeling of loneliness, that's a much more powerful and disturbing cue. And it's not quite clear you know, how you deal with it. So, when you take that experience, um, which we know is, is widespread in contemporary marriages, and then you layer onto that for women this other fact, which is that marriage often represents the institution which provides a certain amount of security and um, pleasure and comfort uh, in the world, but also some amount of labor, um, which doesn't feel equally shared um, and can often feel unappreciated, then the prospect of remarriage after a divorce is, is more fraught. And it, this is not to say that the women you know, we interviewed uh, weren't potentially interested in getting married. They, they generally would be, were open to finding the right person um, and, and kind of wanted to in some abstract sense. But they were certainly not um, rushing to do it. Um, they, they had developed quite extraordinary social networks um, cities today are full of other single women who are living alone, and so there's a whole world of people who provide each other that kind of support and community and care. Um, and, and they didn't feel this kind of urgency to settle. Now add another layer onto this, which is that you know, if you're a woman over 40 and you're trying to do, you want to get married, it's likely that the guy you're marrying is going to be older than you. That marriage is going to come with some responsibilities to care for him. If you know, the actuaries are right, you know, if you're in the typical situation. And that too can be a stressful, even unhealthy situation. So um, what was so remarkable to me and what I really loved about doing this book is how um, intelligently people, men and women, could speak about their way of thinking, you know, could describe their experiences kind of working through these issues, what they wanted for themselves. Um, the, such kind of rich intelligence um, and such creativity, um, this is you know, a social experiment, about how to adapt to these different circumstances. And so what, what kind of emerged for me, I think, is a, a picture of these issues 
that is just very different than the one you get when you look at just the statistics um, and then start making interpretations. You know, so, so we do live, you know, I'm aware that I'm in the Wagner School of Public Policy where you know, economics is uh, you know, uh, a, a big part of, of what's done and the language of public policy is largely the language of economics um, and big data rules. Um, but sometimes um, the numbers don't provide us with their own interpretations. So, you know, sometimes getting beyond the numbers and kind of talking to people helps you get at the, the, the nub of the issue. And I, and I feel like in this case, um, I, I learned a tremendous amount that I didn't know from just the statistics. I don't want to forget the um, question about African American women, because here's a case where I think the numbers do say a lot. Um, and, and that is you know, the, the combination of you know, what Bill Wilson, William Julius Wilson called the unmarriageable males, the men who had lost their steady employment in the um, industrial labor market, with the, the rise of the war on drugs and the kind of dragnet that went through African American communities and continues to go through African American communities, putting enormous proportions of African American men in jail or prison or on parole. Um, you add those two things together, um, and you really, and then, and then layer onto that um, the kind of ongoing prejudice and discrimination that results in uh, not many um, white men wanting to marry African American women or showing much willingness to. Um, African American women are in a real predicament. Uh, the, the marriage market um, is much narrower. Uh, and here's a situation where I think there are enormous numbers of women who, uh, in the abstract, would like to get married. Um, and are finding that their choices available to them are, are very thin. And it's a, it's a serious issue. Um, and there are other people who are working on it as well. I'll make this my last question, and then maybe we can open it up. Um, so I'm going to try to tie this one into the uh, <coughs> campaign. So I'll, I'll tell you the question, and then uh, I'll give you the example that, that makes me think about it. So the question is, is uh, living alone a transition or an identity for people? And how should we think about it? And um, how do you think that different uh, candidates might be uh, responding to it, um, depending on how we think about frame the issue? And here's why I ask, because in the prison system, um, in out, let's say outside of the big cities, um, you will find a dynamic that, that may hold in the big cities, but it, it manifests at a different scale, so small towns, et cetera. Um, uh, and this I've just found recently because I've been spending some time with the FBI and, and of justice going around the country, and um, I meet people who spend time in uh, spend time in small in small town jails. The one thing I kept hearing is that they go because um, they can get away. They may shoplift, they may steal a car, they may do something, and they know every you know good criminals know the thresholds. They can just get away from all the pressures of life for a few months. <laughs> They get, a, they get a bed to sleep in, three square meals, away from the nagging family, and you know, kind of deal with the pressures of taking the kids to school. I can just relax for a second. And this is, an, if you read the psychological literature, this, this is actually you know, jail addiction. There's, there's an entire way of thinking about this. Um, so one of the things that people who run facilities of incarceration, jails, prisons, detention centers, et cetera, have to deal with is that they don't want to make it too comfortable while you know, acknowledging that people have rights as well. So how do you create the right balance of, you know, you're here, okay, fine, but we don't want you to stay very long. Right? And if you keep coming back, then we know we're not doing our job effectively. So why do I use that example? Because this, the people that tend to go through these jails and prisons to be by themselves are not necessarily going because they want to stay by themselves. They're going as a bit of a respite. So is, is and I'm just using a verbally here, is living alone a transition that you find for people? Um, and how would you ever know that in the research that you're doing? Or is it something very strongly held by people as an identity, and, and increasingly so as our society wraps itself around it? And what does that mean from a policy or political yeah. standpoint? So, so we're at a political identity. I mean, we're at the kind of aspiration for people, and we're at the kind of thing that people define themselves by primarily, um, uh, because they're so invested in being single or really living alone. Uh, 
it would there would be um, it would be a field day for political parties, uh, and the candidates would be working overdrive to try to mobilize them because you know the book is about this experiment of living alone, but the being single is a different thing, um, and about half of American adults today are single. So if they, if they were kind of aligned and shared some common set of interests, you know, imagine um, the pursuit. Uh, of them that we'd be seeing from um, the guys Bob Shrum hangs out with. Um, the, the reality is um, very few people uh, are, you know, make a vow to, to live alone. Um, it's not uh, an aspiration for most people. Um, that said, uh, it is a far more durable living arrangement than I had thought going into it. So for instance, um, according to one sociological study, um, it is one of the two most uh, durable living arrangements. After the, the married couple, um, the, the person who lives alone is most likely to still be living alone five years down the road, um, you know, compared to people living with roommates, um, living in families, really striking. It's more, it's, it's more um, durable uh, than I had expected. Um, and, you know, my argument is essentially today people go through life cycling in and out of different conditions. Um, people delay marriage longer than ever before in our recorded history. The, the, average age of first, or the average age of first marriage is over 30 in New York City and in Boston and several other kind of cosmopolitan cities like this. Uh, people put off having children uh, even longer and you know, so living alone has really become this way that young people become adult, um, and they can spend many years of their lives living alone. Now, interestingly, uh, there might, you know, this is not to say marriage is dead or over. In fact, you know, people who delay marriage are much more likely to have successful, you know, long-standing marriages than people who get married very early. Um, so, um, you know, so so it represents something there. But it then not uncommon for people to separate and to spend some time on their own, after, you know, to, to live alone, then to get married, to live alone again, to couple up in, in some way. Um, so it is, a, it, it, is a, it is part of a cycle, but it's not so fleeting as to be ephemeral. Right? It can be a condition, you know, it can be an arrangement someone lives in for years or decades. Uh, and and you know, for older people who are divorced or who separate from, uh, or, or, or who lose their spouse, uh, the condition they're in for the rest of their lives. And, and interestingly, um, you know, one of the surprises for me uh, in the book was to meet so many older people who had lost their spouse, who had, who, who suffered because of the loss and wished that their spouse was still with them, but who also said that their lives were richer and more satisfying and more um, connected than they had expected them to be. And there's a phenomenon that uh, a, a lot of um, gerontologists are interested in today called living apart together, uh, which is kind of older people who are interested in intense and intimate relationships, um, you know, who, who, who want connections, um, but who are not so interested in remarrying or in moving back in with someone because they found that they were, they've been able to remake their lives while living alone uh, in such surprising ways. Uh, and and you, you know, having written this book about the heat wave where so many hundreds of people died alone um, and the great majority of them were older, um, it was a real challenge for me to think about what, what this meant, that, that so many of the older people who lived alone as, you know, we, we spoke with um, said that really their their sense of dignity and integrity depended on their capacity to keep living alone. That if they had to move in with children or with uh, siblings or with friends, uh, that would really represent a loss of something for them. Uh, it, would be a, it would be an indignity. They would feel um, diminished. Um, that doesn't mean that um, you know, they had planned to live this way, but for them clearly, this is life. Um, it's not just a, a, a transient state. There, there's one study I report on in the book that says that the typical American adult today, 
will spend more of her life single than married. That, that doesn't mean living alone necessarily. Um, but it's a really dramatic change. Uh, and in fact, I think part of the you know, intellectual justification for the project, which is, has been about kind of trying to name and identify you know, this thing that I've come to consider the really the biggest social change of the last 50 or 60 years that we haven't um, named or identified and, and discussed, um, was recognizing the fact that for enormous numbers of people, this is not just a, uh, you know, an ephemeral thing. It's not, just a tra it's, it's, it's not just a transition. It's really part of life, and it deserves to be treated that way. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, uh, I suggest we open it up for, for questions and a collective discussion. And, and the only thing that I'll ask is that if you could just keep a, a comment brief and then get to the question as soon as possible. Um, I think there are microphones going around the room. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll ping pong match here. We can start on this side and, and then move back over. Eric. Um, your, your response to Sudhir's first question um, sort of implied that you know coming off of heat wave, you were expecting uh, a fair amount of vulnerability um, with people living alone. Um, and you know, this question is more ambivalent since your book has been a $30 paperweight on the desk the last few weeks. But it sounds like you found a lot of sort of, not invincibility, but, but you found anything but vulnerability amongst most of these people spoken with, and, and I was hoping you could sort of maybe talk about sort of that trajectory that you sort of came along in terms of, you know, finding some of the sort of deeper and, and, and rich meanings of the lives of people living alone. Um, thanks, Brian. Um, this book has been so interesting for me because the issue turns out to be a little bit of a Rorschach test. Um, there are reviewers who come away with it from it, you know, saying this is a really sad book uh, about disconnection and people who can't establish meaningful relationships. Like this in the Wall Street Journal, this was the Wall Street Journal's take on it. And that review came out 10 days before the book came out, so this concerned me. Um, <laughs> you know, and then there are others who write, you know, this is a really rosy picture. That for some reason that phrase, you know, this is a rosy picture. Uh, Kleinberg takes the optimist's you know, stance on living alone. And um, there's a way in which you know, we project an enormous amount of our own <coughs> issues and anxieties onto this topic. Um, I'm completely convinced of that. <laughs> and, and, the, and I'm not dodging your question, it just, it just kind of you know, um, came up for me. So uh, I, we talked to a lot of um, women between the ages of 35 and you know, 45 who felt that they got a lot of support um, when they were living alone as, you know, in their 20s and early 30s, but that once they hit a certain age, um, they became the objects of other people's anxieties. Their, their singleness um, you know, you know, made other people very uncomfortable. So they said, you know, they would say like, I have some friends who's really easy to hang out with. Um, they get who I am and what I'm dealing with, but I have other friends uh, who within minutes of seeing me, start peppering me with questions about you know who I'm dating and whether I need help finding someone and you know what do I think about you know freezing eggs and you know, stuff like that and, and really what they were what they're doing is projecting you know their own stuff which is which is something that we do and I think it's something that you that it's been interesting to, for me to track this in the cor in the course of it and so I'm not innocent of this too and um, you know living alone uh, when you're a married guy with two young children is a very exotic thing. Uh, and you know, because my way in was by you know, learning about this kind of this suffering and isolation in Chicago, I, you know, I, I had my own free notions. Uh, when I started the book, uh, the provisional title was Alone in America, uh, which is a somber and melancholy title. Uh, <laughs> You know, there would be no birds on the, in birdhouses on the cover of Alone in America. There would be, there would be an Edward Hopper painting. Uh, and there would be Nighthawks. Uh, right? Because um, we know this story already. Uh, uh, and moreover, uh, I was um, worried that this was an American thing, right? I mean, we are, 
the inheritors of Emerson and Thoreau and the Lone Ranger and the film noir, you know, detective. Um, we are concerned about you know these solitary figures in some way, and and so and and so I thought this was this is about American individualism and self reliance. Um, so when did it start to turn? You know, when I looked at a chart showing the age distribution of who lives alone, and, I, and it turns out that you know of the 32 million Americans who live alone, about 11 million are older, you know, above the age of 65, but 16 million are middle-aged people between the ages of 35 and 65. And in recent decades, the fastest growing, it's weird to think of myself as middle-aged, but I gotta own up to it, right? So, so the, the fastest growing um, segment in recent decades has been young adults, age 35 and under. And of course, it's expensive to live alone. So it's far more common among well-off people than it is among poor people. In fact, you know, living alone is a fantasy uh, for people living in poor neighborhoods and in poor nations. You just don't find it. Um, and then I looked at the charts of you know, who lives alone internationally, you know, which countries have high levels of living alone, and it was not an American story, it turns out. Um, it was a Scandinavian story you know, about investing in the common good. Um, there, you know, living alone was more common in Japan. Uh, in England and in Germany and in France, so it wasn't there wasn't a cultural story that could tell. You know, it was really mysterious to me, um, and so my nose for a good question is where kind of the more sp time I spend looking at it, the more interesting it becomes, the more puzzling it is, um, the more I need to go and learn. And you know, I think now having been doing this for ten or fifteen years, I'm kind of all the more interested in puzzles that are really difficult. I feel like. That sometimes um, we professors and social scientists become convinced of some conclusion, you know, some theory we believe in, uh, we believe in some way of thinking about the world, um, and we lead with that and not with our kind of interest in in learning. And the, the great thing about our work and the great thing about the university is that it gives us the time and space to actually learn um, and to break from some conventional way of thinking about something. Um, and this has completely been the case for me in this book. Uh, so the, doing the book became a more um, rich experience for me. And you know, hopefully these conversations are also you know, good for all of us because it's not what we normally discuss. It's not the way that we ordinarily talk about this thing. war on family values and a war on the ultimate sort of traditional nuclear good old fashioned family. Um, and what I would like to know from either one of you is what impact has the fact that the large majority of people who are living alone are these very wonderful, intelligent people who contribute in a very healthy and comforting manner to the communities that they are in, you know, because a family can mean a lot of things. A family may not necessarily be mom, dad, 2.5 kids. A family can be a large community of people. So do you believe that they are in fact contributing to the upholding of good family values, even if there is the lack of the traditional nuclear family that surrounds them? I'm not going to say a lot. The only, the only, as you asked the question, I started to reframe it in my head in a different way, almost automatically. And maybe it's because I'm a sociologist. I, I took it as less a condition of individuals, but as new ways. And this comes out in Eric's book: new ways in which relationships are drawn by people who have happened to be occupying a residence by themselves. And as Eric has spoken about, they're they're connected through technology, for example, um, in all sorts of ways in, in which they feel a sense of satisfaction that we fail to recognize because the way that which we grasp them is they are alone and we project all sorts of meanings onto it. I think we can expand the, 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 the focus of Eric's work into thinking about all sorts of commuting relationships, all sorts of ways in which people are just not occupying the same space, but they're in very powerful 
after I read the book, I kept thinking, as, as Eric was talking about, about all the other ways in which we're connected to each other, but that we may not be seeing it because we're tied into these very morally laden, almost oppressive kinds of uh, ways of perceiving the world. And that we have to get out of that and reform, recreate different ways of appreciating how we're all living. Yeah, and I'll only add that I think you know, family values um, could, in the abstract, mean any number of things. But of course, it's come to mean a very specific set of things. Uh, I think you know, Sadir said this very well. Uh, it's kind of judgmental, it's exclusionary, it doesn't recognize the ways in which people are connected to each other that are kind of the non-conventional or traditional um, families. And you know, I suspect um, that, for instance, if the Republican Party decides to uh, you know, uh, run in a presidential campaign, a candidate like Santorum, who you know, pushes these kind of very extreme uh, cultural conservative views about what a good family is, um, and what family values should be, that he will alienate a number of uh, you know, voters uh, you know, who might potentially be interested in a Republican candidate this year. So um, you know, I think that uh, un you know, unmarried women uh, are likely to, be, to vote Democratic, and the Democrats know that and have been uh, searching them out very aggressively and successfully. Um, in 2008, they were able to mobilize uh, single women like that in a way that they had not in previous elections. Um, but they're, they're not just single women, they're single men. And at some point, um, this group of the population, which is half of American adults unmarried, will be turned off by the family values rhetoric. It, it seems to me like it, it's, it's not a winner. Um, before I ask my question, I want to point out that there was nothing lone about the Lone Ranger. You remember Tonto? Kimo <laughs> 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 Um I'm wondering uh, if you dealt uh, in your book and therefore here with the issue of urbanization. Over half the world lives in cities, 70% will by 2050, and we expect. And um, of course, in cities, you can live close with and still alone which is, is very hard to do in the country. Um, and I'm wondering how you felt this played into the whole thing, and if it's maybe totally responsible for it. So, so I wouldn't say totally responsible, um, but it's definitely one of the four things that I say in the book are, 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 are responsible. Is this cut out? Yes. Better? So, the, so, so in fact, <laughs> part, part one and part two, we good? Testing, testing. Is better? No. <laughs> it's kind of fun, actually. Uh, so, so part one and part two of your questions are linked in an interesting way. Um, in 1950, the typical, well, the, the, the places where living alone was most prevalent uh, were the open, sprawling western states, you know, Alaska and Wyoming and Montana, where there were migrant working men, um, including cowboys, like the Lone Ranger, not the Lone Ranger, um, you, know, who, you know, who were on their own in some fundamental way. Today, uh, living alone is an urban phenomenon. Um, it's much more prevalent in cities than it is in other places, although I should note that um, there's been a spike in living alone in North Dakota in recent years. Does anyone know why? Yeah. Frack, fracking, um, you know, migrant working men who are going to uh, to work in the oil industry, they, st they still exist. Um, but it is uh, an urban phenomenon. And um, in the book, I tell a history of living alone in New York City, which um, is a history about gay men in Greenwich Village and Chelsea. Uh, it's a history of um, economically independent women, gay and straight, uh, in, in downtown as well. Um, and the story about the rise of apartment houses, um, uh, about a whole set of uh, clubs and uh, uh, organizations that um, allowed people who were living alone and not in conventional straight marriages to be connected to each other in supportive ways. Um, and in the way that um, uh, kind of bohemias tend to become mainstream, 
over time, uh, the, the kind of practices that were so unusual uh, and eccentric in this part of Manhattan uh, 70 or 80 years ago, uh, in fact, became completely commonplace. You know, so that now living alone is actually quite common on the Upper West Side. Um, what cities do is they create subcultures. And there's so many people in cities uh, that you can often find other people who share your interests. Uh, so you know, whether your interest is bebop jazz uh, or cross-dressing uh, or living alone, um, you're more likely to find other people who are doing it and close by in a big city than you are in a small town or village. And that's the kind of, you know, for Zimmel, who was a kind of the great, one of the great theorists of cities, this meant that um, cities were socially rich and interesting, but also that cities created conditions for this kind of individual freedom. What, what, what Zimmel argued is that <clears throat> cities allowed people to express parts of themselves um, that they that would never have a chance to mature and become relevant and meaningful in a small town. So, in a world like today's, um, where much of the of the planet is urbanized, and there are dense concentrations of people living closely together, um, and then within that, dense concentrations of neighborhoods where being single and living alone is quite common. Right? It's not just these neighborhoods. If I say Chicago or L.A or Boston or Seattle, you can probably name the neighborhoods that are full of lots of single people. Um, you can be in a city or in a, in a neighborhood like this and be alone, but together. Right? You can be connected to a whole world. So you know, kind of add this style of urbanization with the kind of social um, capabilities that we now have through the internet and other social media, which allow us to kind of seek out people who are like us in a way we never could before. Um, and you have, you know, suddenly the ingredients to make being, to make living alone an intensely social experience. I, I also just point you to one part in Eric's book that is wonderful, which is the counterintuitive ways in which policy making has to arise when you take seriously living alone. Two of the examples that I found fascinating were um, one real estate, uh, real estate discrimination, really, in a structural sense of uh, inadequate numbers of units or designing cities in a way that accommodates the needs of this growing population, um, but also in terms of interviews with co-op boards or um, uh, filling out an application and what it, this kind of stigma that might be associated with putting that down that you live alone. The second was. Um, uh, Workplace discrimination. That um, it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to tell your boss or your supervisor, uh, I have to go home because uh, you know, wife, kids, family, husband, kids, etc., partner, kids, etc. Uh, whereas if they ask you if you're, if you're living alone and they ask you to stay another six hours at work, what's your excuse? <laughs> and so there's, there's, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a little, it's not, it's a little funny, but it actually has ramifications in terms of. Of workplace issues as well. So there's a lot of policy lag here in terms of keeping up with this state of life. We're on that side of the room. Is there one question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just my question. <coughs> so we encourage Sherrod Wagner and actually an interview subject for this book back when I was living alone. Um, but not back You're supposed to be confidential. Uh, right. <laughs> Part of the um, interplay or that you haven't gotten to hear about thought was particularly fascinating is the nature of our general existence now 24 7 information constant flow etc and a couple places in the book you at least gesture towards a desire to among those who are going solo to seek refuge in a place of reflection and thought and i'm curious about how much that showed up in interviews is this something more theoretically placed upon it, or did you, in fact, is this a theme that you heard again and again? Could you talk a bit about, in this hyper-connected world, ways in which this does prove to be a, a space for useful reflection? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if I can say that I'm completely innocent of uh, projecting my own, you know, kind of theory and, you know, predispositions, but as I said before, I tried very hard to listen to people and hopefully the voices of people um, we interviewed. And we, I had a group of, I should just say, I had a group of um, doctoral students, mostly from NYU, some in the room tonight, 
um, but also from some other universities too, who worked with me. Um, and we did more than 300 interviews. Um, so a huge number of people were interviewed for the book um, at different ages and places. Um, and no, this point that living alone gives you a chance to decompress um, and turn off after an intensely busy day uh, you know, was, was just a powerful recurrent theme. Um, it's not just you know, Facebook. Um, although when I teach undergraduates, it is Facebook, you know, the Facebook <laughs> addiction thing is serious. Um, you know, it's that um, the kinds of people who can afford to live alone are also working in jobs that require a lot of interaction and kind of information processing. Um, they're often sitting in front of a, a screen or in meetings, um, kind of dealing with ideas. When they leave work, they go to their iPhone. Um, you know, and snuggle up to it and have quite passionate feelings about it. Um, and, and um, uh, you know, they are using Facebook, they are instant messaging, they are on email. Um, they go to the gym and they plug their you know, headphones in to get chatter on, you know, Fox News or CNN or ESPN or wherever, you know, whatever kind of pleasure um, they, they, they get. Um, and if they live in cities, they go out and this kind of busy world, and it can be hard to turn off, right? It can be hard to turn off. Um, and it's not as if when they go home, you know, they light a fire and, you know, kind of throw out all the gadgets. Um, but, you know, I thought that many people who were very reflective and, and kind of thoughtful about the struggle to gain the skill of how of living alone well and productively had really figured out, you know, what kinds of things would be good for them. Um, you know, how to take advantage of the solitude that living alone affords them, and what kinds of things would be destructive for them, you know, which sitcoms. Uh, so, you know, I, I lived alone personally for, you know, a relatively short time, um, but a meaningful time in my life, like what, when I was living alone, that um, I had a chance to do huge amounts of reading uh, and writing and to think about the kind of life I wanted to live, about the kind of career I wanted, about you know the kind of engagement in the world I wanted to have. Um, uh, it was a, it was in many ways a very social time, um, uh, and um, you know, I had this kind of control of my time and space and schedule um, that you know a father of two young children could only dream about. Um, uh, but also the kind of the, you know the, what I gained from that solitude uh, was very powerful to me, and so I, I had kind of. I wasn't thinking about that much when I started the project, but in, you know, when people talked about that as a virtue of, of going solo, it really resonated with me. Hi, uh, Noah Isaac, Swagner student. Um, I was wondering if you explored uh, the sort of less, you know, less rosy side of things, uh, isolation, and specifically isolation regarding Health. I know that uh, here in New York, HCC, along with I believe Professor uh, Billing, sort of identified uh, Medicaid population uh, in, in which uh, people who are sort of the frequent flyers uh, in the system are often uh, living alone or even homeless and don't have connections to a lot of people, and uh, and they're the ones who are you know going to the hospital a lot and, and don't have a support system to help them. With, with possibly uh, you know, very poor health. Um, so, and, and along with that, I'm wondering if you, look, if you consider homelessness as part of some, you know, uh, an example of living alone. Yeah, so um, those are important questions. Um, and you know, for those of you who uh, know Heat Wave or know about it, you know, the, the, you know, those were the people I got to know first. Um, you know, either by spending time in SROs in Chicago, the same room occupancy dwellings, uh, or in um, you know, kind of uh, these abandoned neighborhoods where there was a kind of physical ecology that really discouraged people from going out uh, and, and encouraged uh, them to kind of burrow into, sa into safe houses, um, uh, which proved to be very uh, deadly during the, the heat wave. Um, and so I have an abiding interest in it. And you know, the, those people who read the book and you know, see in it sadness and disconnection and isolation and vulnerability are keying into those sections. Um, so, uh, I don't uh, deal with homeless people because 
you know, the, the book kind of was restric restricted. That the, the people who are in the book are people who live alone um, in apartments that are counted by the formal census. So they weren't people who were homeless. So they, you know, they're, they're like, and Sadir talks about people who are in, in prison or jail, and they are also not in the book. Um, they don't count in the numbers um, that I described, and, and nor do people who live in nursing homes. So if you, if you think about, um, and nor do people who uh, are divorced and have children and count their children as living with them on the census, even though some proportion of the time the children are not there and they're on their own. So the kind of universe of experiences might be even larger than the ones that you, know, you get from the, from the numbers I gave you. Um, so you are right about this um, frequent flyer idea. Um, uh, you know, people who are living alone and are very poor um, you know, are often living alone because they have some um, characteristics that make, that make it very difficult for them to live with others. Um, they can be people with severe mental illnesses, people with substance abuse problems, people who circled in and out of the criminal justice system and have kind of alienated people and other people in their lives. Um, uh, the thing is that there's not a lot of housing for them anymore. The, the world of you know, low-income hotel residences um, uh, was, was devastated by the wrecking ball when the properties that they sat on became valuable you know, downtown properties. I mean, think about the Bowery, you know, just a block or two from here. Um, it's now you know, like the site for swanky hotels uh, and $4 million condos, not the site of the, you know, the Bowery event who Tom White sang about so poetically. Um, you know, that said, there's a, um, a really special graduate student in sociology named Roseanne Haggerty who also um, founded the organization Common Ground, which does really kind of high quality design um, for SROs uh, and tries to, and has worked very hard, kind of they've really become global leaders in this project of thinking about how to make housing for poor people who live alone um, uh, in, a, in a way that gives them dignity um, and makes them feel good about home. Um, and with Roseanne's help, we were able to go into a bunch of different buildings around Manhattan um, and interview poor men for whom it needs to be said, uh, you know, living alone was a much more defensive move uh, than it was for many other people who talked about the ways in which it could be productive um, and social. Uh, a lot of the men who lived in SROs said that um, li you know, living alone was a way of avoiding the people and the places that got them in trouble. Um, and so they would come to live alone, a little bit like your guys you know, in, in jail, um, who needed a way to kind of to turn off a bit. Um, and you know, they're, uh, they too are kind of a, a diversified uh, lot, uh, but you know, they're a big part of the book. And, and you know, your, your question reminds me that I should say something. Um, uh, you know, here in policy school in particular, which is that I, I am very interested in kind of, you know, ways to address the, the truly vulnerable people who live alone and to deal with um, the kinds of, of risks and challenges that we now face because there are people who age alone and are homebound or who don't get the kind of uh, uh, social contact and care that, that we all would want. Um, I came to believe that this kind of generalized lament that I described before about the end of community and the lack of social ties um, is actually not productive for politics and policy. That it kind of, um, in some ways, um, makes us feel helpless um, because what it tells us to do is so far from our experience in the world. Like we don't want to join the Elks Club. Um, and so we don't like this idea that that's the way to get social capital. But also, um, it renders fuzzy all these very kind of sharp, particular things that we could do uh, to provide help. So you know, we don't need to worry about most people who are living alone. We do need to worry about people who are aging alone um, and don't have access to the kinds of housing or services or support that they need. You know, I write in the book. One of the things in the book that was really personal and difficult to write about, what I needed to write about, was the story of my grandmother, um, who my family moved from California, where she lived alone, to Chicago, um, uh, because she could no longer really take care of herself. Um, she had Parkinson's. 
Um, and, you know, she was fortunate enough to have three children who were successful and who could pool their resources and help to um, keep her in an assisted living facility, um, uh, which was incredibly expensive, uh, but which gave her the kind of dignity uh, to have a place of her own. Um, and the support that, that made that possible until you know, she really couldn't take care of herself and needed someone there all the time. And that was such an important thing for my family to be able to do. My cousin was over there and she participated in this uh, as well, um, uh, probably more than uh, most of us. Um, I came to realize that so few people have access to that kind of facility, that that is such a luxury to be able to give to someone in your life. And we have not democratized access to that kind of housing and that kind of care and that kind of support. It is impossibly expensive. Um, it is impossibly expensive. And you know, I, I am not so naive as to think that this is the moment to call for a massive investment program in uh, housing for older Americans with support services. But I am just naive enough to think that someday you know, we will have a better economy uh, and we will have to make decisions about how to invest in our social infrastructure and our material infrastructure and that this issue deserves much more attention um, and it deserves more resources than we give it. Um, and I could say the same kind of thing for the kind of population of people who are very poor and live alone. Um, we could actually do a lot more good and protect a lot more people with smaller points um, that are well-directed and focused than we could with uh, this kind of general malaise um, that we oftentimes you know, get bogged down in. Just being mindful of the time here. 7.30. 7.30, so uh, maybe we'll take another question and then um, we'll give a chance for you to, to wrap up. There's a gentleman in the back with the... One of the things that... Uh, the way, wait for the mic. One of the... It's, I don't think it's working. One of the things that um, Sudhir and Eric have in common is that they're both people that have written books that have helped society contemplate itself more effectively. Um, and at the same time, they're both deeply engaged with theory, and yet they wear their theory very lightly um, in the work. Eric has mentioned Zimmel and Durkheim today, and I was wondering if you could say something about the role that theory plays in your work as you go about interpreting the materials and uh, writing a work like this? You know, for me, really, the move of um, shifting from the social problems framework to the social experiment um, framework um, was one that I think I couldn't make outside of us the kind of a set of theoretical ideas about how to think about the, the individual um, and freedom. Um, uh, and, you know, freedom and, and liberty are, these are not concepts that sociologists use very much. Um, but it seems to me that we, we need them. Um, and uh, a kind of, a, 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 an approach to social um, topics that uh, is innocent of theory, um, that doesn't come from some imagination, some set of ideas about how we work together, um, I think can very easily lapse into this kind of moralistic uh, view uh, that I am talking about with the kind of decline of society. You know, we used to be better. We used to, you know, it's kind of moralistic and also nostalgic. This idea that there was once upon a time um, when everything was better, um, and now we've fallen. Um, and, th and that seems to me to inform, you know, far more of our thinking um, about the the ways we've changed than than I would like it to. And, and I'll say one other thing about um, this theory point. Uh, because I've talked about things like, you know, the marriage market, and um, there's been some economics language here, and I'm, I'm with, uh, you know, the sociologist member of the free economics team. Uh, so, um, you know, so I think this really <coughs> is worth saying. We, we have somehow um, landed in this intellectual division of labor in which economists study choice and sociologists study constraint. Yeah. They, they, they look at what people opt into and are interested in doing, and we then come in and tell them all the things that they can't do. Now, I'm completely convinced that um, we don't get to choose the choices we have to choose from. 
You know, we don't. Our, our choices are structured for us in some way. But we are active, you know, agents in our own lives. You know, we, we do have some capacity to make decisions about how to live. And the social problems framework um, sometimes um, represents us as if we kind of unwittingly fall into these terrible situations because, um, you know, we're, we're dupes or we've lost something. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily respect or recognize and appreciate the kinds of decisions that we make as, you know, intelligent people um, who try to weigh the costs and benefits of different kinds of situations. So, you can't make any sense of living alone without the language of choice. Um, it is true that a number of people who live alone would say that in the abstract they would rather be living in a, you know, the perfect marriage um, or the, the perfect couple. Um, but they are still living alone rather than living with roommates, you know, living with their parents, living with their children, living with their siblings, which is what they would have done 100 years ago. And so we can't make sense of this transformation outside of that. And you know, it, it seems to me that um, you know, sociology, but social scientists more generally need to kind of think more about um, you know, the ways in which we actively create our own lives. We need to appreciate you know, what it means to, to puzzle things through. Um, and doing that, I think, also takes, and I'll end here, kind of respecting the intelligence and humanity and vulnerability of, of everyone. And kind of, you know, for me, writing ethnographically and writing with rich interview material is about, in some part, um, bringing the intelligence of people onto the page. You know, so they're not just um, objects to be studied in the microscope. They're not just um, abstractions to be represented by numbers. Um, they're, they're real people, kind of just like us, uh, who deserve a voice too. Um, and so, you know, that's what theory means for me. Eric, as you think about uh, a final wrap, um, I'm struck by the sense we don't get to choose the choices we had to choose from. There's a Rumsfeldian moment. <laughs> So I'm curious, uh, what was left on the cutting room floor? Many things <laughs> are, that you're thinking about and saying in closing, I'm wondering because books are also choices. They're not always the author's choices, and rarely these days are they completely the author's choice of what gets to be included. Um, and that's not always a bad thing. They're uh, just for limitations of space, et cetera. It, is there, was there an anecdote? Was there a quote? Was there something that you experienced in the making of the book? Was there um, uh, uh, field work? Is there, any, is there something that comes to mind that if you could do it over, and, and, or in the, I should say in the next edition, which I'm sure there will be in the paperback, um, you're going to put that little uh, you know, addition in there. Is there anything that you'd like to add that you weren't able to in this case? You know, so I would definitely add a link to the um, you know, the Rolling Stone website where we got the 15 songs for going solo uh, as music videos, plus, you know, the extended link on Spotify. And we did, you know, we didn't, we didn't have that down at the time. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to add the CD because, you know, no one should go solo without a soundtrack. Um, uh, so two things uh, on this. Um, one is, Penguin was great to work with, and uh, the Penguin Press was great to work with, and they um, really did give me freedom to, to do the, the book I wanted to do, which was really wonderful. Um, no pushback about the notes, um, about the bibliography, about the excursions into Zimmel and Durkheim. Um, I mean, they were really great. They care about ideas. Um, they also publish um, Sidir's $18 book. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which, which you know you should, which you should get first. Um, so, um, so, but there are two things. You know, one is that I am a social scientist and not a journalist uh, in the end. And so, I made a decision that the the stories I would tell 
and the people whose voices would be there would represent to the best of my ability what I found to be typical from the interviews. And I use a kind of qualitative you know, data analysis program that allows me to kind of figure out patterns. And um, that means that on the cutting room floor are some really interesting characters. Uh, and some really good stories. Um, you know, that maybe I'll tell someday, you know, in some other format. I did get to it. There's a part of the book that I did originally as a story for This American Life, the radio program, about what happens when someone dies alone in Los Angeles and the kind of apparatus that the city sets up to deal with a case where no one comes to claim the body of the estate. And, um, you know, that I basically got to transcribe that and then, you know, write a little bit. So that's in the book, too. But um, even that represents something that's significant. Uh, but there are a lot of kind of extreme characters, like were I a journalist and were my job to entertain and just tell good stories, there would be more of them. Hopefully there are enough good stories to carry you through. Um, and then the other thing, uh, interestingly, is um, there are a lot of, in the magazine articles I've written and the newspaper articles uh, that have come out since the book was published, there's a lot of amazing visual material. Uh, you know, the chart of nations that have high, large numbers of living alone, um, the, a map of cities and, you know, where there are a lot of people living alone, and, you know, charts of female and male and age distribution and things like that, which for me are just eye candy. Um, but that, you know, I guess in, after conversations with the editors, we thought, you know, maybe readers don't necessarily want those things. And maybe some of that stuff belongs uh, you know, at least in the back pages of the book, because I think there's a lot of information that is there um, that, that I would want to be there. But since the driving principle um, here uh, is that really deep understanding requires going beyond the, the numbers and the photographs and the charts uh, and, you know, entering into this world of rich description um, and giving voice um, to, uh, to voices and people who, from whom we don't always hear, um, I think the, the words were good. Well, th thank you very much uh, for your patience. <laughs>